party. That's my train, and I gotta go on to the next fantastic voyage into my father's brain. Have you seen my dad's brain around here? Your dad's theory is one of the most important discoveries of all time in science. I would put it right up there with Einstein's relativity theory, Newton's theory of gravity. There really are very large numbers of versions of you that really exist. Now you're blowing my mind. Good. Mark Oliver Everett, known to his friends as E, is the creative force behind the successful cult rock band Eels, who, over the last decade, have been earning critical kudos, a shelf load of music awards, and have even popped up on the soundtrack of the hit movie Shrek. There's nothing that I want to do More than get alone and be with you Trouble with dreams is they don't come true but what many of Mark's fans don't know is that his father, Hugh Everett, was a brilliant quantum mechanic. He developed the groundbreaking theory of parallel universes, a scientific theory that has seeped into the worlds of film, music and literature and is part of our everyday vocabulary. I don't remember knowing when he was alive that he was like a famous physicist. I, I don't know if I ever even knew that till after he died. Dad? Mom? Can you hear me? My dad, who was a devout atheist, of course, um, his uh, dying wish was to be thrown out in the trash. And uh, my mom kept his ashes in a filing cabinet in the dining room at our house for a few years and then eventually honored his wish and threw him in the trash. <laughs> That's the truth. Here's uh, my mom. This is the one. I haven't never seen it before. It was something she wanted me to take care of after she died. Oh, there's one for my sister, too. I've never seen that. Wait, where's, the, where's my father's stone? It's, I just don't get it. It's a mystery. Mark's father was a distracted genius lost in his own world. They lived in the same house for 20 years, yet they barely spoke. In fact, one of Mark's lingering memories of his father was a distressing day in July 1982. It was the weirdest thing because um, I walked in their bedroom and there he was, laying there like sideways on the, on the bed, fully clothed with his tie on like he always had on. You know, I tried to wake him up. And when I put my arms under him and I picked him up, his body was completely stiff. And it was just so surreal because I was touching him, which is the only time I could remember having any physical contact with him. And, yeah. And it was just also so, obviously it was, you know, very traumatic and a horrific scene, but it was also had the added surreal quality for me because, you know, my father had just died, but I, you know, I barely knew him. So it was hard to know how to feel like a normal person would feel in that situation. So I guess it's pretty sad that I had, you know, the one really intimate experience I had with him was while he was dead, you know. I don't leave the house much. I don't like being around people It's better for me to stay home Some might think it means I hate people But that's not quite right Mark fiercely guards his privacy, but he's opening himself up to confront something that, until now, he's only been able to deal with in his lyrics. 
it's been almost the exclusive way that I've dealt with my situation, writing a song about my family. He wants to find out why a scientist as outstanding as his father turned his back on academia's glittering prizes. I'm going to go on this trip because it's something that I knew was coming eventually. I didn't want to wait too long either, you know, with my family history, the uh, longevity rate there. <laughs> well, you have to have a sense of humor. You know, that came from my family. That, that was the way we communicated. Like, nobody said, I love you or anything like that. It was more, it was very kind of jokey, sarcastic family. And that was how we communicated, you know. Oh, what do we got here? This is Bobby's room, yeah. I mean, how many dogs get their own room? He's the most spoiled dog in Los Feliz. Maybe in the world. Understanding how his father came up with the concept of parallel universes is going to be tricky, because science was never Mark's strong point. I only have a very very vague understanding of my father's theory. It gets up to a certain point and it becomes like impenetrable. And then it gets into the scientist language, which is like, it's like a different alphabet they're yeah. using practically. Hugh Everett's theory was so original that it set him on a collision course with the most brilliant minds of the physics world. According to Mark's father, with every choice and decision we make, with every event in our life that could happen in more ways than one, universes branch off in different directions. Every time we make a decision, we divide into two different versions of ourselves. This is how parallel universes are born. Applying the theory to Mark, he splits in two at the very moment he decides to go on his trip. In another parallel universe, a version of himself stays at home in LA while in this universe, Mark sets off. Blinking lights on the airplane wings Up above the trees Mark's father, Hugh Everett III, was born in 1930 on the east coast of America, the only child of a strict military family. But while other kids were busying themselves with marbles and skipping ropes, 12-year-old Hugh was penning fan letters to his idol, Albert Einstein. Set me on the ground once more again Like his father, Mark grew up in the stiflingly rigid confines of American suburbia, in Virginia, just outside Washington, D.C. Still living in the area is Don Reisler, physicist, work colleague and friend of his father's. Mark can only just remember Don from childhood and wants to ask him what his estranged father was really like. <laughs> Hello, Mark. You dressed for me. Absolutely. Wow. Who could turn down this opportunity? I mean, how often does a rock star yeah, come to my house? To see you. Hey, it's delightful to see you. Oh, my goodness. How long has it been? 25 years? 25 years. Or years. Wow. You are now so old that you were the age I was when you last saw me. Really? Yeah. Wow. You guys are always doing the math. Always doing strange <laughs> stuff, yeah. So, come in. Thanks. And uh, be comfortable. There's a bathroom there if you need. Fluids here. We can sit down. Great. When did you first meet my father? Um, 1970. There was a job interview. And he very timidly, I know that's not what you think of, but very, very timidly said, have you by any chance seen my paper on quantum mechanics? Mm, that and day. That day, yeah. Mm. And I said, oh my God, you're that Hugh Everett. Because I had seen it and thought it was the work of a raving lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> and told him. It, you said that? It's all, and he thought it was very funny. And so we, we knew we could enjoy each other. 
Wow. Even though he was of constant physical presence, I, he's really a complete mystery as a, as a person to me. What was he like? You know, that's, that's what I don't really know. Um, he was peculiar and a bit eccentric. He was a very good friend to me in his way. Yeah, I will show you something that friendship and contrast. You have here... Wow, he's outside. Yeah, this would have been late 70s. That's basically what he was wearing every day and every night at the dining room table as well. Yeah. He, that, that was his uniform. The only thing you guys have in common is facial hair. Yeah. And otherwise, you look like completely different, you know, it's like Species. city guy and mountain guy. And yet we were really good friends. Don is an expert in quantum mechanics and starts Mark off nice and easy on his quest to understand his father's theory. All you need is a pencil. If I take a pencil and I cut it in half and cut it in half and cut it in half and just get ever, ever smaller pieces, at some point I may run out of something I can cut in half. You've gotten to the point where the pencil no longer can be subdivided. You've right. come to something that's no longer bits of a pencil, but is something more fundamental. Right. And that was the notion of an atom. Atoms are the building blocks of the universe, microscopic particles that make up everything we see around us, from houses and guitars to rock musicians. They're so small that there are more atoms in a full stop than all the pencils in the world. If you could somehow look inside one of these atoms, you might see what it's made of. In the middle is a concentrated ball of material called a nucleus. Around the nucleus are tiny particles called electrons. These electrons spin super quick around the nucleus. Now, this is the crazy bit. The classical laws of physics seem to work fine for everything much bigger than an atom. For instance, Newton's gravity makes apples go down rather than up. At an intuitive level, these classical laws make perfect sense. But the classical laws all break down when it comes to really tiny stuff like atoms. The electrons don't fly around the nucleus in nice regular orbits, like planets around the sun, but instead they are smeared out around the nucleus taking on a cloud-like form. What's that flaming ball in the sky? And even weirder still, they are everywhere at once. Welcome to the quantum world. What do you think about this? You know, my father, clearly on the top of his game with the mathematics and whatnot, and uh, I, the farthest I got was I flunked out of uh, the easiest ninth grade algebra mm -hmm. class. I just couldn't grasp it. Right. I just don't, I just didn't inherit that gene. Yeah. Um, I thought a lot about that. About how stupid I was in math? Um, I think I'd have phrased it differently. Did maybe my father spoke, spoke of it? No, 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 I'm, I what mean... What a disappointment I was? <laughs> no, I think if your father had had the emotional vocabulary, he'd have been very, very pleased with what you did with your music. Like an old railroad man Riding out on the Blue Mont Line Humming along Old Dominion Blues Not much to see And not much left to lose And I know I can walk along the tracks It may take a little longer But I'm no Jovi looking at life in a rock band sucks, man. On a steel horse I ride, wanted dead or alive. Hugh Everett wanted to win a place at Princeton University to study for a PhD and be close to his hero, Einstein. A glowing reference from Hugh's undergraduate professor confirms that he was already a budding genius. He says, this is a once in a lifetime recommendation. I think it most unlikely that I shall ever again encounter a student I can give such complete and unreserved support. And yeah, that sounds like a ringing endorsement. Hugh arrived at Princeton in 1953 at the age of 22. After a year studying maths, he was persuaded to switch to the far more glamorous quantum mechanics. 
The man who was the catalyst was Professor John Wheeler, his new mentor. Wheeler was keen on a particular experiment. It's called the double slit experiment, and physics professors love it because it's the perfect way to demonstrate the weird quantum behavior of tiny particles. I'm going to tell you what nature behaves like, and if you will simply admit that maybe she does behave like this, you will find her a delightful, entrancing thing. So that's the way to look at the lectures, not to try to understand. I think I can safely say that uh, nobody understands quantum mechanics. <laughs> Mark is going to be shown the double slit experiment by Yi Ma, a technician at Princeton's physics department. You want to see this experiment? Uh, yeah, lay it on me. Okay. See, so what, let's... see if you can make me understand quantum physics. It's a challenge, but uh, <laughs> I accept it. Okay. <laughs> what we have here is a black box, but inside it's rather simple. Uh, here's a laser. Is this laser going to blow my eyes out or anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> they are very... Uh, I went to a Who concert in seventh grade and the laser went right in my eyes and I've had to wear glasses ever since. I and see. Usually we don't see the laser being in the air, so we have a way of uh, showing it. You see that? Oh, there it is. There are many, many little particles uh, we call photons. Well, what's a photon? Photon is just a... Uh, uh, it's a... Uh, Good question. Um, <laughs> you, know, I didn't you don't know what a photon is, do you? I didn't prepare for this question. Yes, uh, this is a hard question. Right. When we say photons, we always give this mass and the unit and size of it because there's no common language you can use to describe it, wow. what it is photon, and massless. So that's very difficult. Wow. So I'm sorry I asked. No, it's a good question, very yeah. good question. I need to put you on the spot. To oversimplify enormously, photons are tiny particles of light. Electrons and photons behave similarly, and both obey quantum laws. But because we can actually see photons as light, they're ideal for this experiment. From the laser apparatus, single photons fire off one at a time. The individual particles then arrive at a plastic barrier with two narrow slits. On the other side is a sensitive TV camera to film where the photons end up. And so the photons will hit the film. What do you expect? You expect we'll hit two spots here, like that, or you expect the photon will go all over the map. What do you expect? We have two slits here. The choices are all over the map or, or just those two just spots? Or just two spots, yeah. yeah. Uh, just the two spots? Exactly. Mark is using his common sense. Imagine this experiment was blown up to a much larger scale so that the particles are tennis balls. And a machine is firing the tennis balls at a barrier with two gaps in it. Of course, you'd expect to find the balls hitting the back wall in two places, in line with the two slits. But when our experiment is done with individual photons from the laser, something very different happens. OK. You see a uh, screen up there? Yep. That's what we see from the camera. See those individual flashes? Oh, yeah. yeah. Those are the photons. Each flash of light is actually an individual photon hitting the back wall. They appear to be landing all over the place. But watch over time and a pattern emerges. Can you see somewhere in the middle of the screen? Uh, it looks like a smudge. Yeah, it looks uh -huh. like a smudge. Yeah. Those are the photon where the photon hits. But it's not two, as we would expect. Is that weird? Yeah, so why is that? That's right, why is that? Instead of the two vertical bands that you'd expect, a series of vertical smudges appear. To make sense of this pattern, you need to look at it from the perspective of a single photon. This photon is landing in a place on the back wall that would be physically impossible if it were travelling straight through just one of the slits. So, the only explanation is that the particle has gone through both slits simultaneously. By the time it reaches the back wall, it has come together again as one photon. 
multiply this single photon a thousandfold and you have the distinctive pattern that Mark saw. Think about it. A photon arrives at the slits in a hell of a quantum state and travels through both. A single object is in two places at once. Now you're blowing my mind. Good. That's, uh, that's uh, our job to do, to blow people's mind. So make you think, right? Phew. My brain hurts. Okay. <laughs> I wish I was back home playing my guitar. And it's not just photons that behave like this. The double slit experiment has been replicated with electrons and with atoms. But we are made up of atoms. So, atoms can be in two places at the same time. Why can't we? One man thought he had the answer, the godfather of quantum mechanics, Niels Bohr. He'd won the Nobel Prize for his research into the atom. During World War II, Bohr escaped the Nazis and ended up helping the Allies develop the first atomic bomb. In 1954, he visited Princeton. While there, he gave a lecture to the students. By this time, Bohr had overthrown Einstein as the giant of the physics world. For a student to challenge him, he'd have to be very naive or very arrogant. It could be argued that Hugh Everett was both. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's me, that's Neil, you. and this is Niels Bohr. This photograph was taken just before Bohr's lecture. The other men pictured are Hugh's fellow students, and they've come back to the college for their own private reunion. Notice that everyone is wearing gowns. That was oh, yeah, required those, in those, those days. Those were dinner gowns. Yeah. You had to wear at, at you dinner. Had wear, you had to wear the gowns. You had to wear dinner at gowns. Yeah, yeah right. there was a big fight lucky, about them. Lucky you didn't have to wear the powdered wigs. Oh, they, they were also <laughs> convenient for an occasional sneaking in of a female. Oh. <laughs> oh. So what, what's was. going on here? Bohr has he, come to give a lecture. He had, or something? Yeah, he had come yeah. to give a lecture. So this is where talks would be given. This would be the place where Bohr would have given his talk that evening. Yeah. Where he had the photograph from. Yeah. I, uh, Bohr was I was sitting over in, I think, a soft seat here, <laughs> and Bohr was sitting about here with a group of all, all the important physicists sitting around, plus Hale, I think, with their ears going like this, <laughs> and I was just snoring over in the corner. Yeah, wow. but he was, he was known to just talk just, very slowly and mumble and never quite finishes his sentences because he was thinking so deeply about getting everything right. If Hugh's old pal Harvey had managed to stay awake, he may have learned the world according to Bohr. Bohr proposed that everything be divided into two categories. Big stuff, like tennis balls, apples falling off trees, obeys the classical laws of physics. However, small stuff about the size of atoms obeys the crazy laws of quantum mechanics. Bohr didn't stop there. He described what happens when you look at something very tiny. At that exact moment, the particle stops behaving so weirdly. Instead of being in multiple quantum states, once observed, it's in just one state. It's now a nice, well-behaved little particle. The whole shebang was called the Copenhagen interpretation, and thanks to Bohr, became the established view. Oh, by the way, Copenhagen was Bohr's hometown. But the young and ambitious Hugh thought it was all most unlikely. How can just by looking at something affect the very behaviour of a physical object? Hugh was convinced that Bohr had it wrong, and so he decided to start on his own radical theory, helped on most evenings by a sherry or five. Harvey? Yes, please. For a while, we had fairly regular sherry meetings before dinner. Very cheap sherry. <laughs> <laughs> toast, toast to Hugh. Hugh, yeah. Great having a chance to. What are your, your memories of, of my father as a person back then? He surprised me from the time I met him until I got to know him that he was as brilliant as he was. It didn't come across until you got close to him. You think he was the, the smartest guy? Well, he was smart in a, in a very broad way. Or do you think he thought he was the smartest guy? Well, I, I think he did, but he didn't, he didn't advertise broadcast it. it. He, yeah. didn't, he didn't, didn't push it too much. No, no he certainly didn't uh, around our house. I, I was not aware that he was like a genius physicist. I don't think ever 
Uh, yeah. I don't, until like after he died. That's uh, interesting. Yeah. Which room was my dad's? The room oh, it's, it's the yeah, it's the room up there with the with the open window. Wow, that's like the penthouse. Yeah. Um, did they put the smartest guys up at the top? Is that how it works? Or? Yeah, probably. Is that the room where he wrote his theory? Or, yeah, it must uh, have been. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty exciting. Yeah. So what year would this have been when you lived here? 53? That's right, yeah, 53 to 54. It's coming to my father's bedroom. So if you lay in the bed in this room, it's said that you'll come up with crazy theories. This is exciting. Like in the music world, it should be like going to the Abbey Road Studios or something. Yeah, Abbey yeah. Road. Right. Interestingly enough, I, I didn't inherit any of his mathematical genius. I, I, I have trouble adding up the, the tip at, at dinner. <laughs> I wonder what you feel you understand about your, your father's theory. I understand that up to the point of anything that can be happening is happening yeah. somewhere. The somewhere part is the, is the hard part to wrap my brain around, you know? I'm in a science show now. Yes, really <laughs> a meeting with Max Tegmark, top physicist and Hugh devotee, is set to bend Mark's brain further out of shape. It's a real honor to get to meet you because <laughs> your dad has just been such an inspiration to me. Oh. When I was a grad student in Berkeley, I found in this old bookstore a copy of this 137 page paper that your dad wrote and it was like wow it suddenly all made sense and since then i've spent many years working on your dad's theory and various implications of it and, and it's just <laughs> so cool for me to actually get to meet you here and to even have a chance to uh, help you understand mark's father wasn't the only one who found bohr's theory difficult to swallow so did the physicist erwin schrodinger as schrodinger himself pointed out in a famous article that there's something really weird about this idea of dividing the world into two parts because you know you are made out of atoms so if an atom can be in two places at once so can you right schrodinger had devised an experiment to expose this absurdity he came up with the most famous feline experiment in science schrodinger's cat It goes like this. A cat is penned up in a steel chamber, along with a radioactive substance such as uranium, a Geiger counter attached to a quick-release hammer, and a flask of poisonous gas, hydrocyanic acid. No. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't even have legs, and now you're going to poison him? Don't blame me. Blame Schrodinger. Schrodinger was never diabolical enough to do this for real. It was just a thought experiment. At the heart of it all is a quantum event. Every now and then, completely randomly, there's a chance of a uranium atom decaying and emitting radiation. This radiation is enough to trigger the counter that sets off the hammer, breaks the vial that poisons the cat. But if none of the uranium atoms decay over the duration of the experiment, the cat will live. What's so disturbing about this is the fate of a single atom, right, determines the fate of a cat. According to the Copenhagen interpretation, until the experiment is observed by peering inside, the entire content of the box exists in two possible states. Each uranium atom both has and has not decayed, and still further, the poisonous gas has both killed and not killed the cat. And this is the paradox. A single cat that is both dead and alive at the same time. That's what Schrodinger couldn't buy, and neither could Hugh. In the winter of 1954, sometime after the Bohr lecture, fortified by some sherry and chat with Bohr's assistant, Org Peterson, Hugh came up with the theory of parallel universes. Hugh argued that everything in the universe, big and small, obeys the laws of quantum mechanics. 
And instead of the observer, Hugh introduced the notion of splitting. Splitting occurs every time a quantum event happens, and this is how parallel universes are created. How does my father's theory solve the, the two different outcomes of the Caddy experiment? It says that both outcomes actually happen. The paradox of Schrodinger's cat had been that the one cat was both dead and alive at the same time. Hugh solved the problem with parallel universes. Two cats existing in separate worlds, one cat dead, the other alive. Hugh's theory was visionary and backed up by some serious maths. He was only 24 years old. Some people think you have a problem that problem lies only with them. Beautiful freak, beautiful freak. In my personal opinion, your dad's theory is, is once one of the most important discoveries of all time in science. I just is, can't emphasize enough how important I think it is. And as I would put it right up there with Einstein's relativity theory and Newton's theory of gravity and so on. And I think. 50 years from now, he's going to be even more famous than he is now when more experiments have confirmed that this seems to be the way the world works. I'm starting to understand a lot more now. I just need to come out here into the nice Princeton air and shake, shake my head a little and let it all settle. Talk to the squirrels. So if one of the squirrels gets the decayed poison, and the other squirrel gets the non-decayed poison. Oh shit, now there's three of them. Now I'm really confused. Here we go! Don't use it. <laughs> This is the archives of Princeton University itself, over 250 years of um, the institution's documents are here. And of course, um, every dissertation that's been produced starting in the 1870s, including uh, your father's 1957 dissertation, which is right down here. So, um, on the foundations of quantum, quantum mechanics. I haven't I haven't heard that title before. Mm. Recommended for acceptance by the Department of Physics, March 1957. Mm -hmm. So this is the opening of the theory. And I actually, the crazy thing is I actually understand it. <laughs> Quantum mechanics is reformulated in a way which eliminates its present dependence on the special treatment of observations of a system by an external observer. I, I, this is getting weird because I... I know what that means now. <laughs> What's happening to me? What Hugh had done was reconfigure the whole framework of quantum mechanics by taking out the need for an observer that Bohr had so relied on. With the hubris of youth, Hugh hoped that Bohr would recognize his parallel universe theory as a breakthrough, a validation of his genius. In the spring of 1959, Hugh Everett travelled with his wife Nancy and young daughter Liz to Copenhagen. Hugh's mentor, John Wheeler, had arranged a meeting between his students and Bohr. Wheeler was worried and had already made Hugh shorten his research paper and tone his language down so as not to antagonise the Grand Master. Even so, the stage was set for a showdown. This is just uh, a picture of the view from across the street of the Bohr Institute, as it was when your father was there talking with Bohr. Oh, so that's where it happened. That's where it happened, yeah. This your is a picture of the two of us, which we believe your father took. Oh, yeah? Yeah. That's a nice shot. Yeah. Yeah. Mark is seeing Hugh's old college pal, Charlie Misner, again. They last met at the Grad College reunion. Charlie and his wife, Susanna, were also in Copenhagen in 1959. Charlie was witness at the make or break meeting with Bohr. We should have Danish, though. We're talking <laughs> are about they real Danish, though, here? 
what happened when my father uh, presented his theory to Bohr? Well, Bohr was deeply involved for decades with a view of quantum mechanics that he had developed and, and was essentially totally accepted throughout the world of thousands of physicists doing it every day. And to expect that uh, on the basis of a one-hour talk by a kid, he was going to totally change his viewpoint would be unrealistic. I, I doubt that there was any striking meeting of minds there. They just listened think, to each um, other. Do you think some of it had to do with their egos, maybe, like, on both sides? That, that yeah. Could... Each of them was sure that they had gone over all this in their own minds, and they knew exactly what was, what was the right way to think about it. And, and it was very hard to find a way to, to uh, arrange a meeting of the minds. So ended one of the great scientific debates of the 20th century. Bohr's interpretation of quantum mechanics remained triumphant, and young Everett's new idea was to be ignored. It must have been incredibly frustrating yeah. to feel like he, he'd come up with something so yeah, kind of the, groundbreaking and then just kind of have it brushed under the rug. Right. Oh, yeah. Oh. It was very sad, yeah. He was always joking when we were around, but I sensed the joking was like the clown jokes, there's a... The a, tears of a clown? Yeah. That's certainly possible. Yeah, I mean, he, he To me, it sort of made sense why he was this kind of isolated presence in the house all those years, just sitting there and not really saying much. I see. Oh, okay. is that right? But I sensed that he was not really happy. Yeah, I think he was definitely depressed. Yeah. You're, his mother was somewhat bipolar, wasn't she? she yeah, she spent time in mental hospitals. Yeah. And, uh -huh. okay. and what about your sister? And my sister, yeah. Was she having also depressions? Yeah. So, yeah. so I think I was, yeah. I could so sense no doubt right. that yeah. she was... There was a little strain of crazy in the family. <laughs> well, I, we have it in our family. My sister committed suicide and Liz also took her own life. Yeah. Right? You know, when Liz committed suicide in her uh, suicide note, she wrote that she was going off to meet, meet our father in a parallel universe. She was a very intelligent girl. Yeah. yeah. So it was very sad. Depression ran in Hugh's family and the rejection of his theory must have been a humiliating blow for him. When he realized the scientific establishment would never accept his brilliant theory, he left academia for good, and his theory disappeared into the university archives. I think I've uh, gotten to like a turning point where I am really glad I'm doing this. It's, uh, it's, it's getting interesting now. To the me that uh, split off and didn't come on this trip. You lazy sack of shit. <laughs> because, I mean, I really feel sort of propelled by the sadness of the tragedy of my father not getting the recognition he deserved because he was just too far ahead of his time, maybe too, too smart too soon. You know, being too smart too soon, he didn't really get a chance to pursue more, I think, because he just felt like, well, what's the fucking point if no one's going to listen to me? You know, I'm getting more comfortable with who my father is. Uh, the more I'm learning about him and the more I feel like I'm getting to know him, the more I like him. You know. I know he was... He's, he seems like a good guy to me overall. He had his problems, obviously tried pretty hard and in his own weird way he, he he's already done more than I've done in terms of uh, being a father so you know got to give him that much he let me play drums in the house that's my training I gotta go on to the next fantastic voyage into my father's brain Gotta go.
Mark has finally summoned the courage to face something he's been putting off for years. My father died when I was 19. My sister died several years later, and my mom died soon after she did. And uh, at that point, I had to go out and clean out the family house. I boxed up a whole bunch of stuff of my father's. It's all been sitting under my house all these years, and I haven't ever looked at any of it. And, you know, it's a painful, painful world to open up. So how long have these boxes been here? They've been here like eight years. For Hugh Everett's biographer, Peter Byrne, this is an eagerly anticipated scientific gold mine, but could also provide Mark with some new clues about his father. Wow, man. This is a, a really cool basement. <laughs> it's a little dusty. <laughs> wow. Well, there's a... Where do you want to start? ...treasure trove here. Well, why not just, you know, uh, work, uh, as they say, linearly. Start with the... That one over there, the, the plastic... started there, there. And, yeah. and then come back and start, like, looking at the work papers and work okay. away that way, you know? Right. Um, it's another rock and roll party Saturday for me. This is a footnotes to a quantum mechanics paper. This is the kind of stuff I would always see him writing at the dining room table would look like this stuff, which, which looks like another language to me. Yeah, I so saw linear algebra, it's, it's quantum mechanics, it's the, the language that they use for it. That's a really good photo, man. Yeah. Wow, it looks like bushy-tailed and bright-eyed. That didn't last long. Then no one took him seriously, and he lost the fire in his eyes. Well, yeah. How would you like to invent, like, one of the coolest things of all time and have people go, uh? Happens every time I put an album out. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Cool. This looks like Ooh, tapes. tapes. Yeah, who knows what's on there, man. That's, uh, that's going to be amazing to listen to that. It's who knows what's you on know, there. You know, the bad news is I remember dropping his dictaphone in the tub once when I was a kid. Really? And ruining it, but hopefully that's not the same one that I ruined. But I don't know if I'd recognize his voice, to be honest with you, because besides the fact that it's been 25 years since he died, I didn't hear him speak much in the 18 or 19 years I lived in the house with him, so... You know, it would probably sound weird to me to hear his voice. Oh, oh there, there we go. go. Let's see if it works. That didn't sound good. This might be the one I dropped in the tub when I was a kid. Hmm. For such an important scientist, archive material of Hugh is surprisingly scarce. There are very few photographs of him and no known film footage. These dictaphone tapes might be the only recording ever made of Hugh's voice. I think we're shit out of luck on this for today. All right, I'll get my people on this. Okay. One of my roadies can probably figure this one out. There's a universe in which it worked, you know. <laughs> After the Boer debacle in the late 1950s, Hugh was disillusioned with the academic world. What was a genius quantum mechanic going to do? Well, it was also the height of the Cold War, and the American military was on a recruiting drive for bright young things. Hugh signed up. Hey, man. We're going to the Pentagon, which I, again, never saw myself going to in my lifetime. I don't think I've ever been there. I don't think Dad ever took me there for daddy-son work day. All I remember was that we had a teletype in the basement. It was directly connected to the Pentagon that was always spitting out all these important messages about the world's about to blow up. Please wake up. At the Weapons System Evaluation Group, Hugh could avoid the draft and earn a top salary he joined some of the brightest minds in the country in military research. And 
hell did I get clearance? Amazing. I'm standing here where like generals make speeches. What kind of kooky world is this? It also makes you ask, how good is the security? If, I, if they let me in here, you know? Because I'm loco. <laughs> All right, back to business. First question, ABC. One of Hugh's documents has been declassified. Called the Radioactive Fallout Project, it analyzes the chilling effects of nuclear war between the Soviet Union and the US. Hi, George. Oh, hi. Hi, long time no see. Hugh's colleague on this project was nuclear physicist Dr. George Pugh. I think the last time I remember really meeting you was a couple of times at your home. At the time, you were busy getting better and better playing the drums. That's right. <laughs> because of their research, Hugh and George could warn President Eisenhower that the military had completely underestimated the devastation of World War III. Do you think my father had any moral issues working for the government? You weren't a couple of trigger-happy guys with the, with the fate of the world at your no. hand. No, after we briefed Eisenhower, there was a gradual shift in U.S. policy not to build so many 20 megaton weapons as they were doing, and for God's sakes, not to go to 100 megaton weapons, which they never So you guys did. really made a, a positive difference in the world. I think that. we really did. Yeah. yeah. It was a darn good thing somebody did what we did. Yeah, I'll say. But it wasn't all bomb talk. The fact that his brilliant theory had been banished to the archives was still close to Hugh's heart. I think it was ahead of its time. As a matter of fact, he and I agreed that it, it was, was ahead, ahead of, of its time. time. It's, uh, now it's 50 years later, so it was like 50 years ahead of its time. I, you know, isn't it amazing that there's a, a term, Everettian? Yes, I you saw know. that. Some physicists are Everettians, some aren't Everettians. <laughs> I might try to get my music fans to you know, call themselves Everettians. You know, I'd like to hear Everettians. your band sometime. I think you'd like it. It's sort of a Everettian rock. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hugh left the Pentagon in 1964, taking with him a million dollars worth of government contracts. He became the president of a private company which pioneered computerized nuclear war games that would be used by the military for decades to come. His business grew, and then something unexpected occurred. Today is a lovely day to run. Start up the car with the sun. In May 1977, Hugh packed up the family and drove them to Austin. He'd been invited to give a lecture at the University of Texas. Things were stirring in the quantum world. Hugh's theory had started to be referenced in articles and books. There was a real buzz about parallel universes amongst a number of young physicists. He was a kind of star at the conference. For shy young physicist David Deutsch, later to become Britain's leading expert on quantum mechanics, it was a terrific opportunity to learn about the theory from its creator. He was deferred to almost uh, like a star. For instance, uh, I, I seem to remember that, that uh, he was smoking and no one else was allowed to smoke. Hugh Everett had finally received the recognition he'd always craved. He certainly seemed to be enjoying the conference. He seemed to be firing on all six or eight or however many it was cylinders and was impressing everybody with the sharpness of his arguments. It was the beginning of a role for the theory of parallel universes, and soon it was seeping ever more into popular culture. Books, television and films all embraced the concept as a staple plot device. 
Now they had some genuine science to go with their fiction. But Hugh Everett would see little of this. Five years after the Texas conference in 1982, Hugh died of a heart attack, exacerbated by his smoking and hard drinking. He was only 51 years old. He had worked on his theory for just three years. The rest of his life had been spent working for the military and in business. Those little tapes that we found in, the, uh, in my basement that were on a strange antique format that we couldn't play, I have now I have my team of experts um, transfer them. A little bit nervous, yeah. I don't um, just don't know what to expect here. Well, let's see what we got. Hmm. Don't really want to play it. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know what to expect here. Well, all right, here goes. Male voices. This should be interesting. Testing, one, two, three, four, five. Testing, testing, testing. Well, it's been a great evening. Why don't you lead on after your drink by telling us how you got started with weird quantum mechanics? Well, it was because of you and Owen Peterson one night at the graduate college after a slosh or two of sherry, if you might recall. Wow, okay, that does, I rem that is my father's voice. I, I recognize it there. Wow, he's talking about like that picture we saw. Oh, we're starting to say some ridiculous things about the implications of quantum mechanics. And I was having a little fun joshing you and telling you some of the outrageous implications of what you said. And uh, <clears throat> as we had a little more sherry and got a little farther into the conversation. Oh, okay. I didn't ask. I got my dad excited. <laughs> it's weird hearing him be so talkative too, because I rarely ever heard him talk that much. He still feels that way a little bit, <laughs> even as recently as last month in Austin. He still a little bit. Feel... Well, was that last month in Austin? Wait, then I know when this is. <laughs> even as recently as last month in Austin, he still a little bit. It's interesting because my dad doesn't sound bitter at all here, and, and I think he's sort of on a high because he just finally got some recognition. The, this is, you know, a month after he went on the, the trip to Austin. And he said, like, oh, you should have been in Austin. There's obviously something wrong here. I showed the paradoxes and whatnot, and something should be done to change it. Uh-oh. He did keep saying why, or, you know. Why. <laughs> I'm playing did, drums. His, his ultimate conservatism, as he put it, kept coming through, you know. Not phasing my dad whatsoever, you know, You had to put Johnny on the straight and narrow track. End of this tape. <sighs> so weird. It's weird because it's like the sounds of my house, you know, there and... Yeah, it's hard because I, you know, I would, as much as I hate to look back on it all and everything, I'd also like love to be able to be back there just for one night, maybe, you know. Various voices, duration 21 minutes, 7 seconds. Sounds like a hit to me. I think it's our cat purring, I'm pretty sure. It's funny if that's my dad recording that. <laughs> if he's recording the cat purring, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, he did have a, a thing with animals that was contrary to the way he was with humans, which I also have too, it turns out, as you may have noticed. <laughs> I thought I heard a duck. We didn't have a duck. Hello there, my name is Mark Gibbard, and I am very great. And you know it because I am great and beautiful and super fantastic great. Do you know that I am great? Da 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 I am great. <laughs> I wonder where my delusions of grandeur came from. Oh, and then we've lost power because it... I told you, this is a weird family. We're all, we were all clearly experiments. <laughs> I'm turning out just like my father. Though I swore I never would. Now I can say that I have love for him. 
I never really understood What it must have been like for him Living inside his head I feel like he's here with me now Even though he's dead I feel like I know my father a lot better, you know, I feel a lot more connected to him, I understand more, like, the, the whole timeline of events and when the, he was dreaming these things up, when, they, when he actually did it, and, uh, and, you know, just talking to all these people that knew him, and it's interesting, it feels like he's around now, you know more than I've ever felt. <laughs> that was too good. I was like, good. I, I mean, I mean, I was just gonna sound like we put that in, in sound effects, you know? It's too fucking perfect. So in the end, I'd like to say that I'm a very thankful man I had some regrets, but if I had to do it all again Well, it's something I'd like to do I'm not a physics genius, I can't even open an umbrella You know, for years I haven't opened up any of the boxes under my house with my dad's stuff and everything And, and I've known it was coming eventually or I was going to have to because of the mounting interest in him But now that I'm doing it I'm really glad I'm doing it. It feels good, and it's such a like genuinely unique experience to go through. However, I still have a little bit of trepidation about the rest of my life having to be like the ambassador from, from the planet Everett, you know. Had I known this was coming, I probably wouldn't have even attempted music and figured, well, I'll I'll get girls this way. Uh, then again, the physics guys, not really the same as rock stars, are they? They are, though, in their world, though, you know? Like, my dad is a rock star of, of the physics world, for sure. Thank you. 